<laughs> Rabbi Belovsky, Julia, friends, it is, uh, first of all, I think even before, Simon, we welcome you, let us congratulate oh, yes, the yes, shul yes. on yes. reaching this wonderful yes. anniversary, uh, your centenary. We always wish long life by saying, bis 120, may you live to be 120. I prefer the version that says, ad mea ke'esrim. When you get to 100, yeah. may you be as young as you were at 20. And that is very much the case here with Dunstan yeah. Road, with the Ramon School, the rejuvenation of the community. We salute everyone who's made that possible, everyone who's led the community, and especially its current and most, most distinguished spiritual head, Rabbi Harvey and Robertson Belovsky. We salute you all and we wish you mazel tov. Um, <laughs> Oh, there you are. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Is that how you used to make your... <laughs> Just in time for Kiddush. Um, so, Simon, um, this is the best thing I have to tell you. Having Simon here, prodigal son returns or something. Um, Both never, senses of Teshuvah. You know, yeah. Never seen a crowd like this. Not even, I learned from your... Uh, reminiscences that when you were here on Yom Kippur, Frankie Vaughan used to yeah. govern here, yeah, and yeah. everyone used to turn up hoping he would sing The Green Door. Yes, yes. You'll or, have to... or, or that we'd paint the doors of the ark green or something <laughs> yeah. to inspire him. There's Frankie Vaughan and Dennis Norton, actually, yeah. were our oh, really? stars. Dennis Norton used to sit there. Frankie Vaughan always had a kind of slightly straight, it was that sort of weird complexion that was sort of frozen halfway between a coat d'azur tan and um, sort of peculiar case of jaundice or something. Actually, you couldn't quite tell. But he was, as they say, genuinely a lovely man, yeah. as was Dennis Norton. So you describe your arrival in Golders Green. You made Aliyah from South End. <laughs> and you said, but Golders Green was just fine with me. 60 years ago, it was an island of cosmopolitanism yeah. between high-minded Hampstead and gritty cricklewood. Yeah. So when a bus conductor shouted, gold is green, get your passports out, <laughs> I chuckled along with everyone else. Yeah. What, it was, what was it like in those days, Simon? Well, it was, it was, it was wonderful. I think actually, um, oddly enough, you know, South End um, seems, you know, absolutely the other pole of culture for Jews, but it wasn't because there were two great synagogues, one large one, mm. Alexandra Road, and then Salan Road, I think it was called, which was in Westcliff. Mm. Um, and it was a very lively Jewish life. That was one of the very rare, relatively prosperous periods in my father's business. So we moved out, had a house facing the sea. I played in the mud and the sand. And I started to learn Hebrew out there on, you know, you can be an Essex estuary boy <laughs> and learn Hebrew from a really wonderful woman called Anne Marks. I was, um, at the moment I slightly cringe but will never forget, is um, I and a little girl whose name I've forgotten were Mr. and Mrs. Shabbat at one point. I'm sure we called it Shabbat, <laughs> which meant wearing, to my mortification, a miniature top hat, actually, he would tell, so that she could be <laughs> the Chalash of Shabbat, you know, so mm -hmm. she could be the Shabbat bride. So I had this sort of sense. And to me, going into London, oddly enough, you'd think where all my, all the Sharmas and all the Steinbergs, my mother's family were, would be, you know, obviously coming to a very lively and dense Jewish community. But I remember, you know, when I did, nine or whenever it was, were, were sort of more worried. So Golders Green, everything about London in the 90, early 1950s was really austere. At least that's where I remember it, post-coronation. The f fogs were serious fogs. We used to, you know, muffle up when they descended on us. Everything was really kind of dark and tweedy. There was still sweet rationing, I think. It's the only rationing I cared mm. about. So Golders Green was a wonderful surprise. Um, there was, uh, yeah, there are multi-generations here. I, my friend Ian Torrance from them is here. And um, the sort of the, if you had said there was one you know, cultural equivalent, really, that wasn't religious in Golders Green 
um, road. It was Cohen smoked salmon. Mm. Um, where whoever it was, I remember watching as a small child. You know, now it's so it's a sort of given, really. Smoked salmon was not in; it was only in high aristocratic culture or in the Jewish life of Northwest London. Those long, slender, um, undulating blades. I remember. You know, whoever, Mr. Cohen himself, but with his many or his many apprentices sliding the knife under that. And um, that was a sort of symbol. There was an extremely lively, warm, and I need hardly say quarrelsome community, really, mm. of course. So tell um, us about Golders the occasion Green. when your uh, mother's habit of providing you with smoked salmon sandwiches. Oh, school, yeah, yes, yes, retaliation. yes which, which goes naturally on from, it's now quite faint. I don't know if you can see it, Jonathan. Can you see a sort of little scar there? It, yeah, look, I have, you I, see I, what I wear smoked the salmon scar. Can do to you. I, my mother's idea of having, obviously I wasn't going to have school lunch, I was going to have coach lunch, but my mother's idea, she, you know, bless her, um, neither cooking nor imagine, she had many strong shoes, she was a great and extraordinary woman, but, you know, um, culinary imagination was not really her strong suit, and why should it be just give me sandwiches to go to school? This is when I was going to haberdashers. And, um, and so I got every day smoked salmon with cream cheese on Hovis. That was it. That was the only lunch. And I munched away. Um, I think I may not have done very well by intercommunal relations, by, by opening my lunch and saying, not smoke salmon again. You know, this is probably not a tactful thing to say. And then my best friend, Steve Sid Harris, you know, at some point it was all too much. And he said, bloody Jews, give me that. And, and um, the sort of thing, and he, no one could have been less anti-Semitic than Sid. He was a lovely boy. But this, this amount of smoked salmon was too much for him. And, um, and so he grabbed it, and I grabbed it back. And he was... He was tearing at the sandwich. He was shredding it with an open pencil sharpener, which caught my hand and required 12 stitches afterwards, actually. This was the closest I ever got to suffering from a pogrom, really. It was a, you know, luckily. I never knew that eating smoked salmon was a blood sport before. Yeah, exactly. There were, Jonathan, no, I remember again in South End days, um, I, I, I've written about this too, that I do remember actually on the wall of the railway track near Southern um, Station, um, the, the letters PJ. And I am asking my father, um, you know, what was it? And he looking rather nervous. So the year must have been like 1949 or 1950, mm -hmm. really, not long after the war. And typically, again, no one talked about the Shoah, even though members of my mother's family, the Neumanns, my mother's mother's family, and the Kiversteins had disappeared in, in Mauthausen. But you didn't talk about it. I, I, I can say when we did start talking about it. But um, PJ, my father, and then, then I sort of pursued it with him. And he said, oh, it's, and he, sorry, he said it stands for Perish Judah. And I was very struck by the almost, you know, kind of strange, archaic quality yeah. of, the, of the abuse. And then he told me about the black shirts and Mosley and his own, you know, he was there at, on those days of, um, um, you know, the Cable Street marches. He was, con he was a street, he was street corner orator. He said to me that, something you'll appreciate, that a Jew's only true weapon um, is his mouth. And um, as a result, I was part of the Golders Green debate team very early. Mm. My father would stand at the back of the Joseph Friedman Hall and he'd say, Louder, Simon, louder, which <laughs> explains, unfortunately, a lot of the rest of my life, really. Yeah. So uh, you came here, uh, you sat just back there. Yeah. And um, your cousin Brian was singing in the yes, choir up there. Uh, yes, up there. This gorgeous, melodious voice. But I should say that if you think about actually what lit the fires, of course, the shul was fantastic. There was rather trollop-like, august Reverend Livingstone, who's, um, 
you know, he was actually a lovely man, but he was very, very solemn. Then he was succeeded by Eugene Newman, who was not solemn, but who was sort of had a low fluster level, and whose <laughs> dress shot were not like yours, my dear. Um, so, but really, what kindled my fire? There was a fantastic cheder where well, I ended up teaching Chumash. You'll be horrified to hear. Um, but there were there were two teachers. There was one scary and slightly whiskery lady called Mrs. Cohen. Anybody remember Mrs. Cohen? But she was a fantastic, it was mostly Siddur and um, with, with Mrs. Cohen and a bit of Chumash. And she was really wonderful. She was ferocious, but inspiring, really. And then it was a perfectly sweet, the opposite to Mrs. Cohen, in the top class, was an absolutely saintly, funny, sweet fellow called Sammy Cohen, Samuel Cohen. Mm. And he did lots of, you know, you start to do a little Gamara a bit, um, Mishnah for sure, um, but he did lots of Jewish history, lots of Jewish history, with a kind of ironic twist, um, yeah, terrible puns. You know, why was he called the prophet Isaiah? Because, and he would then do it, he said, because one eye was higher than the other. And it was lots of... Bad lots puns of, linger in the memory. They, they do, they do. But he was really a wonderful teacher. And I mean, he was one of the great teachers in my life, I think. And a lot of people remember that. Now, you, you're, you describe your bar mitzvah in a wonderful phrase. <laughs> I became, through the mere act of chanted reading from the Torah, connected to the great chain of endurance yeah. embodied in Hebrew writing. Yeah. Oh, I think, I think that, that was before, us. I mean, even before Bar Mitzvah, I, that, you know, was a chor. And I, I did, I used to like the, you know, the Kriyat HaTara moment in, in, again, the children's service. It was a great children's service in Joseph Friedman Hall. I nearly began the book that way, and I thought it was too self-indulgently autobiographical. But I remember actually, as one, you know, put one's cheek on, um, you know, on, on the Sifre Torah, and eventually they were held up, and when they opened, and there was something electrifying about that memory moment. I suppose the kind of baby historian mm. and the very young Jew um, then sort of came together, and I realized that actually history both British history and Jewish history, and it was a kind of kinship between those two because, you know, Churchill was British history and Churchill was the difference between many more of my family being alive and dead. You know, it mattered a lot. And I was constantly almost, you know, um, thinking about endurance, the relationship to storytelling. And um, I was just thinking this evening, of course, and um, one, one must never party poop Hanukkah, but as you all know, the oil business is not actually in either book of the Maccabees, but it, it is in the Mishnah, certainly in the Talmud. I think it mm. first starts. But there is actually second Maccabees I recommend, which was written in Greek. First Maccabees was written originally in Hebrew, but we only have the Greek version. But second Maccabees actually has a wonderful but slightly scary miracle story very close to the beginning. It's written, second Maccabees is written as a letter to the Jews of Egypt who are experiencing constantly their own forms of persecution. And I'm only talking about it now because it is one of these kind of chain of memory things. And the story there is that before the Jews go into exile, um, when Jerusalem finally falls, um, they bury um, an ember or a flame mm. from the fire um, used to light the sacrifices in the temple in a secret place. And when, when Nehemiah returns, thanks to Cyrus, he somehow knows where it is and recovers it. Um, and a sacrifice is laid out, and there's just this mysterious... There, that's oil. It's described as a kind of oil and, um, in Greek. And the clouds part in the sky and a, a, a flash of sunshine, spon there's a moment of spontaneous combustion because Jewish life is starting again. This, this is another kind of Hanukkah miracle, really, one that we've kind of forgotten, it involves sacrifice. But there was, this, there was that sense in me very early on of being connected to the richness and the joys, not just the suffering of a very long, long Jewish tradition, yeah. So when you came to do your television series, yeah. you actually started in Egypt. Yes. Uh, the yes. most unexpected place. Yeah. You didn't start with Abraham, you didn't start with Moses, you didn't start with David. 
you started with the Jewish community in the Elephantine. Elephantine. Now, yes. why did you start there? Yeah, I, I, the book does. The, the book starts there, actually. The, the, and Elephantini arrives halfway through that first program, which is sort of a, a run around your excellent question. I was slightly, I was nonplussed. It, it, the, the historian in me always needs to engage with the truth or otherwise of the Tanakh, of the Bible. Not that it's a falsification, but you know, most of, of, of Bereshit, of Genesis, and of Shemot are written, have to be written many, many hundreds of years, 400 years at least, after these events happen, after the Exodus happened, and after the possibility of, of Abraham leaving Chaldea. And I, you know, I thought, well, how do you do that? I, what I knew I didn't want was backlit camels going across the <laughs> screen you know, at that point. I actually wanted something where we have an immediate, irrefutable piece of evidence about a Jewish community. And that was, just happens to be because of the survival of these extraordinary papyri documents in Aramaic. And you can go and see them in their beautiful number of them in um, the Brooklyn Museum. I remember one afternoon in New York going to see and they pulled out of a drawer. And of course, um, you know, Aram class so-called square form Aramaic is the Hebrew we all use. You know, original archaic Hebrew, as you know, looks almost like Akkadian or something. It's like, those of you have been to the Israel Museum and seen pottery shards um, uh, or that extraordinary um, little kind of amulet in archaic Hebrew from Hinnom, mm. from the cemetery in Hinnom. No, original Hebrew does not actually. So what, what we think of as perpetual Hebrew is actually square form Aramaic, which means that when these papyri were pulled out, you can kind of read it, even though it might, put it mildly, my Aramaic is nearly non-existent. But it was, again, extraordinary in, in absolute clear letters. And what they're talking about, one of the things they talk about, is um, what we should do on Pesach. Mm. And um, so you know, in the fifth century BC, um, the Jews in a kind of galut, in this remote soldier boy city, which you can, the streets of which you can walk around. You can't walk around anywhere else in the world, in the Middle East. You know, um, even were Mesopotamia peaceful, as we hope one day it might be, there's no way to walk around. But you can walk around Elephantini. Um, it's very near Aswan, and I recommend you do. And very amusingly, um, what do they say? The Egyptians are still shy of saying this is a Jewish town. So it's <coughs> called Hittite town or something like that. You know, so it's completely absurdly euphemized. And they're discussing the number of days that, that Pesach is, and um, very interestingly, Chametz was not taken out of the house. It was brought into the house, but in sealed jars. Um, and um, this was absolutely, you know, we have names of people. We know who they were. We know who the women were. We have the equivalent of Kutubot. Obviously, we weren't called that, but nuptial. Um, so this was, this was a real documented community. Um, the, the Bible is so beautiful. It's an extended poem, um, and there's lots of history in it. But there's not day-to-day -day shopping and nuzhering and worrying about your husband and dowry. That's not very much. The closest we get to, I suppose, is Book of Ruth or something like that. So you have a kind of day-to-day, -day, almost soap opera, of, of staunch Jewish life in this improbable place. That's, that's I think, why I want it. I mean, the, the whole book begins, um, you know, with in, in this place at a certain time. In the Achaemenid Persian Empire, a father was worrying about his son. Mm. And it is, it, it, that's actually a papyrus about a son who hasn't showed up to get his new kit, his new outfit mm. that his dad was bringing him. Watching those programs unfold, and they were masterful, it was very clear, I think, to all of us that you got more and more personally engaged as we went yeah. through this series. Until when you began talking about the history of anti-Semitism, about the Holocaust, yeah. and especially about Israel. 
you were really taking risks. You were putting yourself on the line. Yeah. Talk us through some of your feelings when you were doing that. You felt, here I am, Simon Sharma, a Jew, who is yeah. commanding world attention. I feel there are certain things that have to be said that I, as a Jew, want to say and, and want to be out there. Tell us what thoughts you went through, when, especially when you were talking about Israel. Well, I don't know what I was, I, you know, I, I could do no other, you know, not a Jewish thing, Luther, but I, I, I knew when I started both the book, which I'm still, you know, now in those two, two things I wanted to do. I did want, because I wanted non-Jews as well as Jews to be paying attention, um, because I think part of our troubles in explaining um, the necessity and um, virtue of Israel is that the rest of the world knows Jewish history only in terms of the Shah and about which they feel guilty or not, you know, and that, that doesn't help either. Um, saying sorry is entirely beside the point. Um, or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this is all still with me because we're coming up to 1917. You and I will mm -hmm. have discussions about this, I'm mm -hmm. sure, and we have to be prepared for the onslaught of ignorance about the Balfour Declaration <laughs> that will come our way. And that, so I really wanted there to, to give the rest of the world a sense of what Jewish life was like without the assumption of the kind of death star of the Third Reich and the programs hanging out there. But it's a big aval, it's a big but. Which, which comes to the heart of your question. Um, I, I don't know why I'd forgotten, but um, I remembered all over again how much, you know, the enormity of the tourists and the trouble. But thinking about 1492, for example, um, you know, the, the, we know Tor Kramada, we know, you know, the Inquisition, we know terrible kind of Kiddush Hashem moments, the year of the Crusades and so on. Um, but it was indescribably terrible, really, um, the, what happened in 1492, um, in that we had no notice, we had forced to sell our property. You know, I kept on seeing, and there was a piece of camera on that road outside Cordoba. This you couldn't script, I suppose. Mm. A bit, I don't, certainly not comparing myself to Moshe Rabbeinu, but I very much felt like a kind of ventriloquist. I will throw it, every script you have. And actually, you had the strongest sense of companionship. I can't remember, you'll remember probably, but there was a, one of the enemies of the Jews that year. Um, it witnesses this long train of men, women, and children with nothing. Well, Jews were not allowed to take money out of Spain, of course. Um, and which meant they couldn't, and no pack animals. So many, many of us really walked, it, sometimes even the old and the sick and babies, which, of course, you know, brings to mind many other long trains of people leaving, trying to leave catastrophe. And um, the, that same priest, the Dominican priest, even he talks about being moved when he hears women comforting, singing, singing songs in Ladino and sometimes in Hebrew to comfort those who were crying, both young and old. When you're faced with that, when that's, you can't say that, but you, you try and it's impossible to find a cool television calculated point to see both sides of the issue. So it was very much, I felt very much in the sense of a kind of responsible storyteller in that way. Now, I come to the Israel thing. The Israel moment, which I'm sure some of you found upsetting about what I had to say. Um, no one could, you know, I am, I, I've always been a two-state Zionist. I still am. I'm absolutely, I mean, the first moment that shocked people, not Jews, but sh shocked everybody else, is when I was actually looking at the Judenstadt at Herzl's in that cafe in Cafe Spell in Vienna. And I said, um, let's be clear about it, because I hate the fact that Zionist, has, the word has been something that we're supposed to be, we're supposed to apologize for. 
And I said, you know, given actually what happened in the years of Dreyfus and given the fact that the mayor of Vienna was an anti-Semite and given the fact that all these promises of equality are becoming a dangerous and sinister joke, you know, I said, why would you not be a Zionist? And that, again, was something I knew I was, you know, basically departing from BBC guidelines. And I thought, obviously, I don't, <laughs> I don't care. The one at Israel which, which was more which was very difficult. So I go through the whole of that story, unapologetic, unrepentant, explaining that be it began with the suicide of Ziegelboim um, mm -hmm. in Bayswater because of the failure to get anyone to do anything. Even, you know, Bermuda, that horrible moment, ostensibly the Bermuda Conference in 1943, where everybody knew the magnitude of what was happening to the Jews. And still nothing, you know, the word Jew was not even mentioned at that refugee conference. So I go through all that with righteous anger and explanation. And then when I get to the wall at the end, you know, and we talk to a, a, an angry, but rather, rather uh, wonderful Palestinian man who'd lived in that village just outside Jerusalem. I, it wasn't, I, I said, I, what I said in a piece to camera again, completely unscripted, was that if you don't live in Israel, um, you, you have no right to complain about the wall because there were suicide bombings before and far few now. But did it, you know, did I think ultimately we would find peace with walls? And I said, I didn't think so. I, 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 was, I certainly did not have the presumptuousness to say, take it down, you know, absolutely not. But I did want to actually respond to the sadness inside myself, mm. really, at that point. Well, look, Simon, since we've come this way, since you have told the story yeah. of 1492, the way we're supposed to tell the story of the Haggadah, yeah. as if it happened to us, let me just ask you this question which I suppose all of us ask ourselves. There must have been a sense in which, it's all a matter of definition, but anti-Semitism, as we know it now, probably was born there in Egypt, wasn't it? Around the, let's say, third century BC, there was an attack yeah, on the Alexandria. temple in Elephantini. There were attacks yes, on Jews were. in Alexandria. Yeah. There's Manito, the Egyptian priest, that is particularly who poisonous. rewrites yeah the story of the Exodus and says it was Pharaoh who wanted the Jews to leave, it was Moses who wanted the Jews to stay, they're a right. nation of lepers, they, they got rid of them. So you see something being born there pretty much at the dawn of historical records extending through to 1492, extending through to Europe in the 19th and 20th century, extending perhaps to some extent to now. Is what, as a historian, you say about anti-Semitism, is it something that is historically inevitable, or is it I, you something know, that has... I was has really hoping you are going to answer your own question. Well, I will if you want. I'm not. Yeah, I'm Only because it is, it is really, I, every time I... It's constantly, and you know, you're special, Jonathan, and you know this very early history. One wants to say... Um, but it, exactly as you've just said, it's not historical to say it begins with crucifixion guilt. It begin, because it doesn't begin with crucifixion guilt. Yeah, this early history that, that, um, that Jonathan is describing is extremely upsetting that we, because it contains this element of that the Jews were biologically kind of a contaminant. That is really extraordinary. Manitho was a second century BC grammarian and because of the close relationship between Egypt and Rome, this sort of weird phobic prejudice about the Jews is, um, is, is uh, exported to some of the most important figures in Roman cultural life. Like well, it gets, Tacitus, like it gets Tacitus. into Tacitus, yeah. and then from Tacitus, and Juvenal, and it Seneca. gets into Schopenhauer, right. and from Schopenhauer, yeah. it gets straight to Hitler, because yes. Schopenhauer became yes. Hitler's favorite but I, but author I, because I know, of that. I know, I know. So, I mean, one wants to say, you know, some of it has got to do, but I mean, as I, as I say these words, I'm not, I, I barely convince myself. 
<coughs> but some of it's what to do with the contempt for pagan gods, which again is odd because, as you know, we arrive slowly at our monotheism and in a kind of shadowy way. It takes us a long time. Um, you know, if Neachrim, you shall have no God before, you know, beside me, before others. There's this sort of sense in which there may even have been a hierarchy of gods very, very early on history of Judaism. But when we arrive at it, by the time Devarim gets its, you know, rewrite, which is strict, fierce monotheism, it, you know, unless you happen to be in a particularly relatively laid-back world, which one supposed Cyrus's Persia might have been, and we do know about the Achaemenids, that they actually mm -hmm. unusually were very happy to cultivate, so far from actually imposing what would it have been, early form of Zoroastrianism mm -hmm. or something, imposing their religion mm -hmm. on, they were relatively happy for local religions to thrive and prosper. And there, were, mm, there was nothing in the government that many other cultures couldn't participate in. But for others, for the Romans, and maybe for the Egyptians too, but, and certainly in, because we're talking about Rome and Egypt, the insult, the affront, really. Um, I mean, Tacitus does at one point, I think in when he's describing the Jewish wars, but he does reluctantly, it's a backhand compliment, um, says that theirs is a religion of, I mean, it, not, it doesn't use the word of an abstraction, of an invisible God, and that from that comes their strength. And he sees it for a moment before his, in, the intensity of his prejudice takes over. You know, I, but it is very difficult. That's why I, I bounce the question back to you. You have to earn your wages as a malamad here. I mean, the intensity of something like John Chrysostom, which is again, you know, this, this, is, a pre, this is a Christian in Antioch, famous sermons are, what he wants to do, what, what Chrysostom wants to do famously, is physically segregate Jews from Christians. Partly because he, he's worried that Judaism is still quite seductive, isn't it? He was it, worried that they'd go to shul. Yes. Well, they are going to shul to hear the shofar. Well, you should have told they him, They are going you know, to shul to hear the shofar because they think it's good music, you know. And well, what must have had very bad to. music otherwise, you know. <laughs> yeah. But apparently the droshes were quite good in those they were, days. They were thrilling. Apparently. And they were uh, thrilling. I, I, that That's was, right. of course, the problem. Let's let, just, just remind ourselves of this. Um, one of the things that became very ironic was that, and this is really the argument of Not in God's Name, my new book, is that both Christianity and in a certain way Islam saw themselves as part of the Abrahamic family and defined yeah. themselves yes. in terms of sibling rivalry with Judaism. Right. And they were the old covenant, we Christians and the new covenant. But a lot of Christians in Chrysostom's day were still interested in Jewish roots. And as you say, yeah. he wanted to segregate between the two. And an entire literature known as the Adversos Judeos literature grew up among the church fathers in the third and fourth centuries, which laid a kind of sediment of real anti-Semitism, I think, yeah. which didn't really explode into persecution immediately, but it was a kind of depth charge that could explode mm. at any given moment. It was that literature which Jules Isaac, the French historian who survived the Holocaust but lost his wife and daughter in it, uh, exposed. And then Pope John XXIII read his, his, uh, read his work and set in motion Vatican II, which resulted, John died in, in 1963, but it resulted in 65 in Nostra Aetate, mm. which was the one really positive note in all of this, yeah. that Christianity was able, after all these many centuries of hostility, what Jules Isaac called the teaching of contempt, um, was able to reverse itself. So, in a sense, Jews and Catholics now meet today as friends, no, not as enemies. But do you feel that somehow or other that virus, which may have been cured in some parts of Christianity, has now infected some parts of Islam. Oh, it sure has. I just, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. I, I mean, I just wanted to get straight whether you think um, 
as, I mean, what you're suggesting, which I think is right, is that Jewish life in the Christian world for a long, long time um, was vulnerable because it was treated as a kind of shadow world. Mm. By, I mean, that's why, you know, the, the, the most terrifying attacks, physical violence against the Jewish community in Spain were in the 1390s. And the force of the Inquisition, of course, were brought to bear on those who came to be called Moranos. It wasn't, it wasn't there, was, there was a third of, the, third of the old Jewish community remained openly Jewish. It was those who'd converted, but who were, and rightly suspected, of practicing underground Judaism while professing Christianity, who were the demonic threat for the inquisitors. And again, if you think of another moment in the middle of the 16th century, I think it's Pius V, um, the, 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 the creation of the Roman ghetto, which is much worse than the ghetto of Venice, ghetto of Venice, so whose 500th anniversary we're commemorating mm. next year, but the Roman ghetto was really a horrible place, uh, full of humiliation and degrading physical conditions, happens after um, a, a number of popes and a number of cardinals actually are intensely interested Hebraists. Of course, they're interested because they want to, you know, they want to hasten conversion. They want to hasten the last days, but they, some of them accommodate rabbinical teachers in their own. So there's, a, a, again, a sudden madness that we, we've let the seductive pseudo-Christians or something like that sort of into our house. And I, I'm not saying that's the cause, but I think it actually... It's that the equivalent of that in the modern period is that, again, the hidden Jews as perverters would be the success of assimilation in Germany. Mm. We, we hated them when they all had peyot and lived in their ghettos. Now we really hate them because they look just like anybody else. Mm. Now I think we've got, and you, you've spoken very eloquent about this, we, uh, uh, you know, we have a kind of e evil graft. What's happened is that the kind of visceral phobia um, uh, of um, pieces of the most hideous bits of Christian anti-Semitism, for example, the blood libel, um, have actually, and the protocols of the elders of Zion as well, have been attached to Islamic hatred of the, as they see it, the indignity and anomaly of Jewish life, never mind the state of Israel. The state of Israel is an open wound that never seems to be healed properly because it actually seems to be a kind of violation of Muslim prophecy. And I'm talking only about the most extreme mm. form. But for a Salafist, it, this would be an, an open wound that would never really go away. It represents well, we the had opposite the of Medina. The most extraordinary example of it was it yesterday or the day before. Uh, this um, radical couple who gunned down... In San Bernardino. In yeah. San Bernardino. And his father was interviewed. And his father said, you know, my son was obsessed with Israel. Yeah. And I said to him, my son, don't worry about Israel. Don't worry about it. In two years the state of Israel will no longer exist. <laughs> Which is the worst. So think. that <laughs> is what a moderate tried to de-radicalize his son I with. I didn't read so, that. That is So it's fairly scary terrible. stuff. That is well, very scary we've stuff. landed up with a really cheerful uh, conversation here. <laughs> On Hanukkah, so, um, you know. Before we get to the cheerful stuff, what about some questions from the audience, Julia? Um, we will get, I promise we'll get cheerful before the end. But how I expect you Jokes. <laughs> we have a few uh, free organised questions and then some others on the floor. So I'm going to start off with Daniel Hochhauser in the back there. Uh -huh. uh, now we have roving mics, so um, we can make sure that we have the mic. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I just wondered why, whether you focusing on Jewish history at the moment, at this stage in your career, could it have occurred at any stage in your career? Or is it mark as kind of summation in your career? And similarly, the article which we were quoting at the beginning with a very warm nostalgia. Board, yeah. Would you have written such a warm nostalgic oh, yeah. article 50 years ago? Sure. 30 years ago? Sure, sure. I, we may have had this sort of, you know, 
chicken soupy feeling now in my as I enter, <laughs> you know, the springtime of my senility. You know, <laughs> so I think it probably um, you want to try and remember everything you can as an exercise. You know, brain calisthenics. No, I did write a, a, a Jewish history book before, which is probably mercifully out of print, um, called Two Rothschilds and the Land of Israel, which is about Edmond de Rothschild. It's commissioned by the late Victor Rothschild, who was an extraordinary fellow, both brilliant and very scary. Did you, did you have much to do with him, actually, John? No, but uh, interestingly, this was, my fir this was the first book of yours I read. And the reason is because in... Um, 1988, Dorothy de yeah. Rothschild died at the yeah. age of 93. Was she a she member of wonderful. Golders Green Shul, or was it? No, uh, she, no. she was. I never met Dorothy de oh, Rothschild. She was wonderful. She used to come, I think, perhaps to uh, Marble Arts Shul yeah. for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Like she, so she knew me. So uh, she left in her will. Could I please conduct her funeral? Wow! And uh, I. Uh, didn't know about this lady, so I read yeah. your book, which was totally brilliant. And I discovered the most extraordinary thing about her, that as Dorothy Pinto, yeah. uh, she went married to uh, James, James at the age yeah. of 17. Yeah. But am I right in thinking she was Chaim Weizmann's assistant? Yes, that's right. At yeah. the time of the Balfour yeah, Declaration. That's right. that's so here was a woman who actually um, lived through Zionism, yeah. actually f built with James the yeah. Knesset. Yes. And uh, then left Jacob, her nephew, yes. Jacob Rothschild, with the task of, uh, of building the uh, Supreme right. Court building. Yeah, exactly. And you know he's building the new Israel National Library, by the yeah. way, between the Knesset and the Israel Museum. This would be a wonderful thing. Now, two so, good stories about the, and I'll come back to un answer the question. Um, two great stories about, no, we haven't finished yet, Julia. <laughs> Victor was, he was, very, he was scary, he was very brilliant, but he was, he was a tough guy. And one point he wanted me, I was supposed to go and help organize the Pika records, which were still, were not quite, particularly the very interesting day-to-day -day records of, um, of both Moshavim and Moshavot, both kinds of, and the very early Kvotsot like Daganya, which both Ika, Maurice de Hirsch's organization, and Edmond, supported in the years especially before the Balfour Declaration, in the, in the last years of the Ottoman Empire, and there were day books there. And it, they were rather fragile archive, and I was, there was a wonderful man called Yaakov Everhadani who had done some initial catalogue, and I helped, and then they were flown to Cambridge. To, but, but there was one, I was going too slowly for Victor, so at one point where he always used to welcome me in with a, a little tipple, usually Mouton Rothschild, you know, and <laughs> turn that down. And then he, then he would turn on you, if you weren't much, and he said, Simon, you remember what our family motto is, and I couldn't for that moment, I still can't, and he said, service, and by God we get it. You know, <laughs> just, so it was, uh, I woke up once, I loved Dorothy, she used to protect me a bit from the wrath of Victor, and, um, and I used to go out to um, Ethrop, which was uh, her beautiful pavilion, you know, um, next to Wadston. And um, first time I went, um, I, I, uh, you know, we had to dress for dinner, and the butler, there was, of course, a butler, said, um, he said, you'll be wanting these to be pressed. He said, picking my trousers up as though they were kind of rotting fish. And, <laughs> and then he said, um, and may we bring you your morning tea, sir? And I said, oh, that'd be extremely nice. And he said, would that be lemon or... Um, no, he said, would it be Indian or Chinese? I said, oh, Indian. He said, um, would it be lemon or milk? And I said, oh, milk. And, it, and then came the actual sentence, the Jersey or the Guernsey herd. <laughs> so, I thought, honestly, this is not a normal Jew, you know, really, actually. So. But the answer is, I think that... So I did make my sally into that particular history about which Jonathan's been incredibly kind. And I did feel slightly, you know, we had this thing in the 60s particularly, um, that history, you either did history that's very close to you, if you were English and you were, you know, the Civil War, or you did history that was not close to you. And for some reason, I don't know, I, I was interested in the Dutch and French. I, I was interested, 
for some reason, may have been just intellectual or moral cowardice or something, and something that was not mine. I, I was worried about the objectivity, subjectivity thing, um, and so I, I chose the different path. It was, you know, a kind of galut, it was kind of a deliberate exile. What I did do was run what, what um, lovely Julia Neuberger, once my student, calls the Shaminar, a seminar in post-biblical Jewish history. It's a really a reading group in my rooms, because you actually couldn't do Jewish history, could you, actually, mm. at Cambridge? I think mm. even in the moral science, certainly right. there was no place in the history tripos at all. Right. Yeah. So I had this little reading group, you know, starting with, I mean, we just picked and chose. One time we do the, you know, Chassis, uh, we do the Kabbalah and Safad another week, we would do Rosenzweig, and so it was a wonderful, wonderful group. And, um, but I didn't want to do it in, and it was, it was when I finished, oh, what was it? Um, I think the American history series on television called The American Future with the book, that I got a call from somebody who no longer works at the BBC is saying, um, I know exactly what you should be doing next. It was as though my mother was calling me. You know, <laughs> that, and my mother had died not long before. And, um, and it, was, it was really about this. You don't call, you don't write, especially you don't write. <laughs> And it was absolutely like, you know, like Yona. I mean, I felt uh, you know, I wasn't going to go to Tarshish and that. But well, if the BBC wants to do it, and I had to make sure that the book I knew I could do, although it was, of course, incredibly daunting. It was supposed to be one volume. There's no way that was going to happen. Uh, it will be just two, though. But I knew that I thought, well, if the BBC wants to do it and they're going to let me, I don't want any political correctness going on. Um, uh, you know, if they're going to let me say what needs to be said, then why would I not take that opportunity to... Re and, you know, I went round with, at the time, the television series and the book on the usual book tour, and um, they were wonderful audiences, but, you know, it's places like, I mean, very far-flung places where there are very few Jews. And there were always a few Jews there. There were two other small groups of Jews if I was in Ely or I was in I, Bath or somewhere. And there'd be a group of Jews who said, I didn't know I was Jewish. My one had a father who'd come over in the kinder transport. And once I found out, I didn't know what to do about it. And were very kind and said, you helped me, you know, find out who I was and, and what I was made of. Then there were the people, none of you lot, I think, who Stephen Pollard, mischievously and brilliantly, editor of Jewish Chronicle, called the Azadews. And the Azadews, always stand up and the first thing out of their mouth is as a Jew and what they're going to say <laughs> is that Israel does not represent Jewish values mm. and the as a Jews always have a go at you and I have a go right back at them. Mm. You want to say when we were last in shul is what you want to say. You know, <laughs> the as <-a> Jews. Yeah. <coughs> you talked about 1492 and about 1940s from that, what historic lessons do you have for our current migration crises? Oh, our current migration crisis? Well, I felt, you know, I mean, I think you know what I'd say. I mean, I said it and nearly got murdered on question time by the detestable Rod Little. Um, but, you know, I, I'm obviously, you can't help but... Actually, do you know what I said on question time? Because I knew they would say, oh, you Jews and the Nazis, or some version of that. I actually wasn't talking about Jews and Nazis. I said, actually, when they brought up the issue of refugees, of which, you know, 200 Syrian refugees at that point had been admitted, I said, well, it, if it hadn't actually been for the fact that my own, you know, my own, both my families arrived before the Aliens Act of 1905, I wouldn't be here, and some of you might find that. But I, I try to recover that increasingly bitter and difficult atmosphere in Britain and the creation of the so-called League of British Brothers in the period before 1905, which led up to the first restriction. No one was listening to this. So I'm not saying it's a simple question. I'm not talking about completely open frontiers, but, you know, can we afford to be, you know, generous? I don't think you can have memories, really, of the night. You know, what happened to us in the 1930s, not just in, in this country, was much more liberal than, than the United States, where I live, where the gates of immigration slammed shut in a much more adamant and brutally exclusive way. 
So I think one, I, I hear what you know, Jonathan wants to say about this. I mean, I think, it, it, remember you are a stranger in a strange person's land. I mean, I, you know, that is deeply within uh, the fabric of our, our memory, I think, really. <clears throat> I, I think I said what I had to say at the time. I thought kinder transport was a model. It did not solve the problem. It was a small light in a great darkness. I don't think Britain or Europe can solve the problem. I think the enveloping chaos that's absorbing not only Syria and Iraq, but ever wider spheres is the root of the problem and it's horrendously difficult to solve. And it would take us far too long to be able to move down there. But the fact is, that um, the Frenchman who was a prisoner of ISIS for several months has just been, I don't know if you saw, he, uh, he uh, produced a little video, and he was saying that it was those humanitarian gestures mm -hmm. that were the strongest possible blow against ISIS. Yeah. Because ISIS continues to demonize the West. And when Muslims see that refugees are not detested or rejected, but welcomed. That is, he said, and this is a guy who really has been closer to ISIS than almost anyone alive. He said that is the great victory of the West over ISIS, that ability to deliver these humanitarian gestures. We know they are small in proportion to the total problem, but they are monumental and they are what led us to love Britain. They are what will lead at least the moderate Muslims to reckon that you can't continue to defame the West and see it as the source of all evil. I was very struck we all were by, you know, scenes of parents with small children, really. I mean, be, partly because as magnificent as kinder transport was, kind of guaranteed vast majority of children would never see their parents again. Yeah. So they had to leave them behind. So, you know, the resonance of that is deeply tragic. What do you see as the future for our children's generation as Jews in Europe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Always the easy questions from a Jewish audience. Um, look, I, again, to, uh, uh, you know, to just remember a, a scene in the mayhem, and I hope this still exists. Remember when Benjamin Netanyahu went to the great synagogue in Paris and wanted and made a about how all the French community should pack its bags and, you know, make Aliyah the, sort of the next day. And the, the community, that was after the kosher supermarket and Charlie Hebdo murders. And the community responded by singing the Marseillaise, you know. Uh, I, you know, obviously, it, I, I, I don't see it as, and I don't want it to be, um, the beginning of the end of Jewish life in Europe. I, I love, you know, um, uh, the long history, the richness, the beauty of, uh, you know, if, if, it's, if, if we have a, I would rather fight anti-Semitism as loudly, as clearly, as urgently, and as adamantly as we can. Because for all the kind of, you know, the horrible morphing of anti-Zionism into anti-Semitism, which is a problem, and we're seeing overwhelmingly in France, but though you get the occasional bad smell here too when cowards or people panic-stricken take Israeli goods off the shelves of supermarkets or the dreadful boycott. You know, we're called on to fight that because there are countless people in all, as I said, you know, all my non-Jewish audiences, really. Countless people all over the country who still welcome and hospitable and celebrate. We are now in this country, a multicultural country. You know, Jonathan's a hero in this. And, um, you know, you can find in both the Christian and the Muslim communities, uh, it's not easy, but plenty of ways in which actually to celebrate the heterogeneity 
of British culture. And I think that's true in, in other countries as well. well. One thing has become absolutely clear, and we have to say it loudly, that if it is no longer safe to be a Jew in the streets of Europe, then it is no longer safe to be a European in the streets of Europe. Yeah. We yes, have brother. to stand and fight. Were Jews to leave Europe, this is exactly what our enemies want. Yeah. It is exactly what they're trying to achieve. They know that if Jews remain in a country, they are the strongest and ultimate defenders of freedom. And toleration. And yeah. toleration. Yeah. And they are always in the forefront. And I have to tell you, knowing what I do about the other minority communities in Britain, it is that non-Jews know that we have brought something to Britain and to Europe, and they look to us for courage in the face of this terror. I really mm. think so. I think in the fullness of time, the world will look at Israel's courage in facing up to terror. Whatever issues we may have, at the end of the day, Israel has refused to be intimidated after 67 years of relentless assault on its right to be. So the fact is that whether in Israel or in Europe, we stand and fight, and we will discover that though Jews do have enemies, we have many and ext extremely good friends as well. And if we stand together and defend freedom together, we win. Yeah, I think both. We're, we're not, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have That's right. Don't, don't, we don't, I, I, you don't do councils of despair, I think, really, you know. Question over there. Yes, sure. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Miguel Nadal, and I'm a guest here from St. Mary's Catholic Church in Hampstead. I'd like to ask you a question. The historian, Tom Holland, has summed one of the appalling difficulties we face today as the consequence of the appalling literal nature of the interpretation of Islam by whole sector and growing sector of, the, is, uh, of the, is, those who hold the Islamic faith. And I want to ask you, to what extent do you think that literalism at the time of the birth of Christ is, as was then the pre-Mishnah, pre gemorah pre-Talmudic interpretation of Jewish law, was actually responsible for the rise of Christianity. Um, that's in your, uh, <laughs> your department, my dear. <laughs> so in your department. <laughs> that is a really good question, you know, right. Um, um, Number one, as we know, and Maimonides says this to um, the sages of Marseille in a letter that was only discovered and published in 1929. And uh, mm. he says, you know, there's a whole Jewish tradition in the Talmud as to why Jerusalem fell because of internal internecine uh, divisions within the Jewish people. Josephus tells us this in great detail. The Talmud calls it Sinat Chinam. Maimonides, in this letter on astrology to the sages of Marseille, says that actually Jerusalem fell because they were all expecting the Messiah. And therefore, they were convinced that they could not lose against Rome. Now, in the end, that literalism led to an enormous mess series of messianic moment, uh, movements who read, um, you know, the, the rather apocalyptic prophecies which begin with Ezekiel and culminate in the book mm. of Daniel. And they expect, as it were, this new Malchut Shamayim, which we and the early Christians called the kingdom of heaven. This would suddenly impose... The, the, the dark forces and the children of darkness would be defeated and God's rule on earth would arrive and that would be the end of well, history. It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well, isn't it? It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. exactly so. <clears throat> so, and you find therefore um, within Judaism a messianic moment 
which Paul discovered had more resonance in some ways with the Gentile half-Jews that constituted something like 10% of the population of the Roman Empire at the time. And so it, the Jerusalem church, led by Jesus' brother James, James. Mm. essentially ceased to be with the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. And the Pauline church, the Gentile church, as it were, went on its own trajectory. So there was a sense in which people were reading texts literally and expecting this miraculous victory to emerge. And that is a scenario not unlike the scenario that ISIS is currently teaching its followers, that if we begin this process, um, then uh, the caliphate and the, the rule, the return of, of honor and power to the empire and to the ummah of Islam will emerge. It's a very, very messianic moment. So, um, yes, in early... Judaism, in late Second Temple Judaism, out of which Christianity emerged, there were these very literal readings of prophecies of the end of days. And uh, they are currently being read by ISIS, who mm. foresee this great confrontation. With Rome, epic, as they call it, with Rome. With Rome. They call it Rome. You know, they call all of us Rome. Yeah. So they are real mm. literalists of... of uh, of apocalypse and the end of days. So yes, um, it's quite dangerous to read texts literally, and um, I would urge Muslims and Christians and Jews to go back to those very elaborate traditions that all three faiths have, I, which I, is that every no text without context and no application without interpretation. Yeah. I would just add one thing to your, you know, really interesting question is, it, it, um, is that um, it, it helps us all. We really, you know, you can just do online good homework actually about Salafism and Wahhabism, which are not the same. And in fact, there are many varieties, a good starting place. Um, it sounds like a much too sensational article, but it c couldn't be less is an article in the Atlantic magazine by a, man, by a scholar called Graham Wood, G-R-E-A-E-M-E. March. Yeah, called What ISIS Wants, actually, which is about end of days prophecy. Mm. Um, and it's a good beginning primer, actually, about two different kinds of Salafism. What, you know, one which is Salafism, as, as you, I'm sure, know, means just um, our ancestors. It means pure, it, it's a cult of origination, really. And it wants to privilege the Medina moment, what, what is called the Medina moment, which were involved a lot of forcible conversions. Remember, Medina was Yatrib, and as Yatrib was a largely Jewish city. You know, never forget there was a huge Jew, ethnically Arab, Judaic practicing culture in, in, in the peninsula. But so there the are two kinds of Salafism. There are those who really just do practice kind of practice a religion of origination, and those who, again, in the kind of coarse, um, militant, charismatic version, um, you know, carry it to the next step of, of actually being instructed to commit to battle um, in, in the kind of more brutal jihadi way. Um, but we have to take we have to take the theology seriously. Sorry, uh, Julia, I know you want to, I just the only extra thing I want to say because it's not you want to say well how is it possible um, that the appeal of something that seems to be so as it were retro to be very crude about it could grip as you say such an enormous number of people that has and here with my kind of crude historian hat on I'm sure has something to do with the collapse of Marxist nationalism. And again, you know, even I say that, that sounds kind of think tank crude. But the complete failure, I mean, on the one hand, we have the collapse of Marxist nationalism of the Nasserite, Ba'ath Party, autocratic kind. On the other hand, which is something that the two of us in our different ways have been paying attention to, liberalism with its tradition of pluralism and toleration and freedom and human rights has been reduced essentially to shopping. You know, liberalism hasn't sold itself with the passion and enthusiasm 
and intensity that what John Locke and John Milton and J.S. Mill and, you know, and our own Jewish contribution to that, Martin Buber, for example, requires us to do. <coughs> and that, that's where I think we've been partly failing. And Jonathan's last book, but many of his books, are sort of a magnificent antidote to that. Um, through all the years and decades of historical research and interfaith work that you've both respectively been through, I wondered who was the person, either from another faith or another age, that you found you most admired? Um, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> I, um, I want to say something here. You know, it's, it's very interesting. When uh, I've, I've never been to Buenos Aires before or since, but I happened to be there the day Pope Francis was chosen as the new Pope. Mm. And knowing my interfaith connections, the local Jewish community said to me, how did you know there was going to be a vacancy? <laughs> <laughs> the fact is that uh, when Pope Francis was uh, elected as Pope, a um, journalist from La Repubblica, one of the papers in, in Italy, uh, wrote him an open letter, very critical of the Catholic Church's historical record on many things, including its treatment of the Jews. And Pope Francis wrote back that um, the Jews through all the centuries have stayed faithful to their covenant. And their faithfulness to God through all those centuries places us all in their debt, not only as a church, but as humanity. Now, never in 2,000 years of Christian history has somebody said something like that about Jews. This man went further than John the 23rd, further than uh, John Paul II. You know, when John Paul II went to the synagogue in Rome in 1986, he spoke of Jews and Christians as elder and younger brothers. Everyone loved this because it sounded like fraternity. However, anyone with a ear, biblical ear mm. would have known yeah, yeah. that Shnei Goyim Bevidneich, when uh, Rivka was pregnant and the twins were struggling in her womb, and she went to ask God what was this about. And he said, there are two nations in your womb, and two nations will separate from you. Yes. And the yeah. elder will serve the younger. Mm. Now, Paul in the epistle to the Romans says, guys, uh, you know, we may be Gentiles, but we're the younger ones, and they're the older ones, so we're the Jacob, and those Jews are the Esau. So when Pope John the Paul II said, we're all brothers, just remember what happens to brothers in the book of Genesis. Not great news. So um, John Paul, who was a wonderful man, still had limits. And uh, even John the 23rd, when Jews came to see him to thank him for Vatican II, said, Ani Yosef, Aod Avi Chai. You know, I am Joseph. He was welcoming his brothers. Do you remember what? his brothers tried to do to Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, these were wonderful, heroic figures in Catholicism, and I don't take away any of their greatness. But Pope Francis' statement, and, and an open reply to the journalist from, from La Repubblica, is an unprecedented statement in 17 centuries of the Catholic Church. It takes courage for somebody for a Christian to get up and say that Jews' faithfulness to Judaism is not their obstinacy and their rejection of religious truth. It is their faithfulness refusing to be separated from their Father in heaven. Now, I salute a man like Francis I, but I also say it shows what a simple declaration can do to change centuries of hatred. And I wrote, not in God's name, just to plant maybe an idea 
in one young Muslim's mind that one day a Muslim will get up and say the same. Yes, we are all brothers and sisters in the family of Abraham. But you've been here a lot longer than we have and we salute you and we recognize your integrity. And the moment that happens, something too will change in the course of history. And we will change a long narrative, the longest of all narratives of hate into a narrative of respect, mutual integrity and peace. And the sooner it happens, the better. Uh, I, I think Simon was sort of drawing to a close. So yeah, I would just, I would, story, just I, I would say, you know, well, Maimonides is someone, you know, because actually he gives us all of himself, you know, some of, one, not just um, a sense of the fusion of classical philosophy, really, with Jewish tradition, but also his immense, sometimes cantankerous humanity, beautiful, you know, when the Jews of Yemen write in distress at facing terrible persecution, and whether, because of the kind of Kiddush Hashem tradition, they should die rather than be converted. Maimonides said it's not that straightforward, you know, actually, um, and invokes a Talmudic tradition by which conversion imposed under duress was not necessarily the deepest of sins. But I just want to finish with, um, it's not somebody who changed the world particularly, but someone who any, I think, historian is going bound to feel kinship. There was a, yo there was a youngish postdoctoral student called Emanuel Ringelblum who found himself, who was a student of the great Polish Jewish historian Simon Dubnov, and who found himself in the Warsaw Ghetto mm -hmm. as it was becoming clear what the ghetto was about in, in uh, 1940. And he gathered the, many of his young um, disciples and students um, to form a group called Oina Shabbos in Yiddish. And what they were, they were, they were working, um, the Judenrat was then controlling, well, how one feels about it, the management, of course, of the ghetto. And uh, there was a kind of parallel organization of which Ringelblum was a part. And what he wanted to do, what he did, was actually go to each of the apartment blocks, increasingly crowded with despair and disease and horror, um, being um, responsible Jews, had committee meetings every five o'clock or in mm. the afternoon, but to, to see how many children had died, how much milk there was, where drugs could be got from, medicine, you know, from outside the walls, and to, to keep the records of what daily life was like. And he knew quite early on that they, would, they were all going to die. Uh, he did die during the um, ghetto uprising in, in April 1943. And he was creating an archive complete with pictures and diaries and, um, and they, were, they were hidden in milk churns actually and buried on a particular place. I can't remember exactly where in the ghetto. And then one of his group um, survived by jumping off the train on the way to Treblinka and eventually led Poles back to these, these milk churns with the archive of Oynik Shabbos. <laughs> Uh, in the Jewish Museum. There are some which seem to be surviving underneath the foundations of the Chinese embassy, which is not, alas, about to dig them up. But he said something very moving, and he was not a kind of sentimentally grieving person, Ringel Bloom. He said, I, I would love to be spared uh, in order to see the story of our troubles brought to the light of day and he knew he wouldn't be. And so I thought just, you know, if, we're, if a lot of what we've been talking about this evening is memory, Jewish sensibility, history, and profound sense of tzedakah and a sense of justice as well as a kind of merciful version of, of charity, that ran through, you know, sometimes we just think of historians and our lives as an academic exercise over and over and over again from Josephus or even from some of the late people who wrote the beautiful thing that is the Bible onwards. History has not just been an academic
profession for us, which has been, as Jonathan said early on, endurance and what we want to give to our children. Support. Let, 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 let me, if I may, just end with the story because it was a bit, tiny is a bit gloomy at times. Um, and uh, let me end with a story that I learned from some young Muslim children in the East End of London. You know, where my father came from, your father, we, sure. they were both in the Schmutter business. Yeah, right? sure were. And uh, I'm sure they knew one another. They probably played bridge together or something. It, it smoked salmon together. One way or another, that now, that whole area now, Brick Lane and Shoreditch, is, is almost entirely Bangladeshi um, uh, Muslim. And a Jewish couple decided in one of the streets there in the East End, 19 Princelet Street, which was in originally a Huguenot chapel Huguenot. and then became a, 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 a shul and has been lying uh, desolate for several decades, created in there a museum of immigration that told the story of Jewish immigrants and Irish immigrants. And these Muslim kids go to the museum and they immediately identify with the Jewish sto story and the Irish story and they see they are part of the same story. And uh, these six and seven year old Muslim kids, <coughs> at the end of their visit, were taught a little Jewish play, which I saw them play out. I saw a video of them actually telling this story. So here is the story as told by seven year old Muslim children from the East End, where our families came from. And these Muslim <coughs> kids told the following story. They said, once a Jew came, a small trader, with his horse and cart and his goods to a, Jew to a little town in Eastern Europe where the people were so anti-Semitic that no Jews had ever gone there before. But this Jew decided he's going to go to this town. He arrives at the town and the entire town population come out and shout, Jew, Jew, expecting him to disappear into the distance. Instead, he comes down with a beatific smile on his face and says, thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. <laughs> I have never had such a beautiful welcome before in my life. And he takes out his little money bag and, gives a, and, provide, and takes out five gold rubles and gives one to each of the men who are shouting, Jew, Jew. Well, they're a bit astonished at all of this but still five rubles is five rubles. So they go away mystified, but at least interested. The next morning, they surround this man's house and start shouting, Jew, Jew, again. And again, he comes out with a huge smile on his face and says, thank you for another beautiful welcome. And he gets out his wallet and says, well, you know, uh, I can give each of you one ruble today, but..." You've made me so welcome, I can't thank you enough, and please accept a ruble. So they accept a ruble is a ruble, and they go off. The next day, they come round shouting again, Jew, Jew, and he comes out with the same smile and opens his wallet and says, I'm afraid I don't have much money left. Uh, I can only give you today 10 kopecks each. And the people look at him, scandalized. And they say, for a mere lousy 10 kopecks, you expect us to shout Jew, Jew to you? Very good. And they never and shouted Jew again. Well, now, good. if young Muslim children can make that their story, which is our story, then we will find a world in which neither Jews nor Muslims are abused again. Let us hope I've, that the lights I've, of Hanukkah will light up a very dark I've world. got one slightly uh, more, less edifying um, interfaith story. So, you know, Moshe and Jaime are having their Sunday walk and they see a sign in the front of the church which says, um, um, bonus for conversion, 50 pounds. And they said, oh, they'll try everything is going, you know, but then Jaime says, well, Times are hard, you know. Yeah, the conversos, the Moranos, we don't really have to believe. 50 pounds are 50 pounds. Um, so, um, you know, Moshe is incredibly shocked. So, but he says, you, all right, I won't tell anybody if we split it. 
So Jaime goes in, comes back out 20 minutes. So Moshe said, you know, was it? Was it? He said, yeah. And um, said, so did you get the 50 pounds? And, um, and Jaime says, that's all you Jews think about. Money, money, money. <laughs> you know. Simon, thank you so much. Bless you.